It's like all of a sudden it, it is here. And just to give you a, a, a little bit of a, a picture of the calendar coming up, um, obviously oh, next weekend's the biggest weekend of the year for, for Christians. So we'll, we'll talk about the resurrection of the Lord and all that that means. And then we've been, we've been in this series on redemption stories. We have one more redemption story that, that we'll do after Easter, but then we will go into a series um, from the first few chapters of Revelation, where we'll look at those, those letters that Jesus sent to the church. It's, it's one of those rare times where we actually have Jesus' words of what he has to say to the local churches. And we'll pick that apart. And since Revelation is one of those books that is, uh, oh, let's be honest, it's not the easiest uh, to read. And uh, forgive me for saying this, we do it pretty poorly at times. Uh, but here's the deal. Revelation is meant to be read devotionally. So along with the series, we're going to do sort of, not really a Bible study, but maybe at some point during the weeks, we'll have a, a Zoom uh, meeting for anyone that would like to join in. And what we're going to do is look at how do we read Revelation? Uh, Bible study tips. I'm not going to do the work for you. But what I will do is, is we'll come together as a group and say, hey, here is how to go about reading those harder portions of Scripture. And so during this series, we'll have a Wednesday night series as well. I think it's on Wednesday night. Don't hold me to that. Uh, but next weekend is Easter. That means today is Palm Sunday. In my early uh, days of preaching, I didn't get too worried about the church calendar. It's, it was like, yeah, you know, Easter is here, but we'll just stay in the series until then. As I've gotten a few more grays in my whiskers, um, honestly, I've, I've seen the value now of standing alongside nearly a billion other Christians today and saying today together we remember this and to step into the line of 2,000 years of Christians saying that today is important because it's the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And if you, if you study your, your, your gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you study those carefully, you'll see that all of the writers hit the brakes right here. So they'll move pretty fast, but then they hit the brakes here because this is the beginning of of the most important week in history because it is the most important week of the most important person to ever live. It's called um, the Passion Week. Now, when we think passion, we think strong emotions, but really it came from uh, a Latin word which meant to suffer. This is the week where Jesus heads into his suffering. So if you have a Bible, would you open it to Matthew uh, chapter 21? The crowds are pouring into Jerusalem for, for the Passover. Uh, that's, that's the celebration. R remember, if you've been around the church for a bit, back in the Old Testament, this is where um, God came and he rescued the Hebrews from Egypt. Well, they celebrated that, and it's called the Passover. And every year, uh, all of the people would go to Jerusalem for this. So what would be a, a small town on the top of a mountain, they, they call them mountains, they're really just big hills. What would be the, the small town here now just swells up, and there are people everywhere. Um, there is, at this point, now a buzz about this prophet Word has it that someone was actually raised from the dead. Word has it that, that blind folks are now able to see. I mean, the stories that are, that are surrounding this, this prophet from Galilee, are they're, they're pretty hard not to get excited about it, to think maybe he's actually the Messiah. And it gets so busy and there's so much going on that the Romans have to increase security uh, because they have to make sure everything stays in order. And just so we, so we can see the picture, uh, there were certain songs that they would sing. They're called the Psalms of Hallel. So Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. They would sing these, and these are the songs that remind them, the songs that make them re think about the deliverance that came and is still to come. R remember, on the night that Jesus was arrested, 
after he instituted the, the, the Lord's Supper, it said he went out and they sang together. These would have been the songs that they sang to remember that the Lord saved us and that there's a redemption to come. This was a time for, for the Jewish people to, to look back and to look forward. So Jesus and his disciples, they, they make an eight-mile walk from, from Jericho to Jerusalem. And the distance between the two, it's basically an uphill walk all the way. It goes up about 3,000 feet during this eight miles. So they would sing. They called them the songs of ascent. So as they go, it's just this, we're going up because we're going to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, oh, for in, in their mind, that's where heaven and earth touch, right there at the temple. So to, to go up, oh, it's to be close to God. This is the biggest time of the year. The date was most likely March 29th, AD 33. I'd like for us to step back into that time for just a bit. Matthew 21, I'm going to start in verse 1. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them, and he will send you at once. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see your king is coming to you gentle, mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So just so we see a little bit of this, here, here's a, a, a map as they would have come from Jerusalem. You see Bethany, Bethpage. Uh, this is, re remember where Jesus raised Lazarus? Basically on the backside of the Mount of Olives. It's very dry and arid there to, to the right of the screen, but as you come over the Mount of Olives, all of a sudden then there's olive trees and it's very green and you get to see the great city of the king. For them, it would have been like looking at heaven. And at some point in that journey, he sends two disciples ahead of him to procure a loaner vehicle. He says, hey, go and you're going to find this, this donkey. Now, we, we don't have any idea. Did Jesus arrange that? Uh, or was it just one of those Jesus things where he said, hey, this is going to happen? The text doesn't tell us. All we know is that it, it, it happened. Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience with the specific intent of saying, this is the king you've been waiting for. So he ties it back to Zechariah 9.9, 9, that, that Old Testament promise that, that said, watch, you're going to see him. You're going to see the king. He's going to come to you riding on a donkey. That's how you'll know it's him. And, and honestly, the last king to do this was no less than Solomon. Solomon was the last one to do this. Oh, but now the greater son of David, the greatest king is coming home. This is him arriving to Jerusalem. Now, the, the, the gospel writers here are very, very careful they're weaving together a bit of a tapestry to tell this incredible picture of, of who this Jesus is, of the king coming to live among his people and then ransom them back to himself. Or as, as John would put it, the word became flesh and he lived among us. Just before, now this is one of those rare events that's recorded in all four gospels, just before for each one of these, the, the gospel writers will tell you something very specific and then tie it to what is about to happen here. So Luke, yeah, it's, the, it's called the parable of the minas. It's this picture of the king is coming back and there's a judgment coming with him. That is what Luke wants us to know. So he says that and then eventually, or then immediately says, and so this happens. Matthew and Mark. 
Both record Jesus healing blind folks, doing stuff that doctors can't do, uh, the healing of blind Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timothy. That was his name, and he was known for his condition. But Jesus was able to change his future. And then there were the ones that, that said, uh, son of David, have mercy on us. Oh, and he changed their future as well. This Jesus was doing things that no one else could do. And then John, well, John takes it to a whole different level. Just before the triumphal entry, John records Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Life undoes death by the power of his word. Right on the backside here of the Mount of Olives. Can you imagine? Just think about what the gospel authors are trying to say right now. The king's coming and there's a judgment coming with him. This king isn't like anyone else you've ever met or even heard of. He has the power to do things, oh, that no doctor can do. As a matter of fact, he is God himself. He is life and he undoes death. That's who this Jesus is, and it all culminates in this moment. Remember, uh, in Jerusalem, just on the other side of the hill, man, the crowds, oh, they're in, they're in a frenzy. People talking about this Jesus and what happens. And, and honestly, Jesus doesn't disappoint here. Up till now, he's told everyone, hey, you keep this on the down low. You don't go telling everybody who I am. No, you, you keep quiet. Now he's about to make an entrance that there can be no other, no other uh, 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 idea that this Jesus says he's the king. He's the Messiah, and he's coming to his place to reign. The king is here. Matthew 21, look at verse 6. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt. Then they laid their clothes on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks out on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. And then the crowds, oh, they went ahead of him. And those who follow shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he'd entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar saying, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. If we see this, this next picture, the, the, the great thing about Israel is it's a living archaeology dig. It, 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 as you see it, it's, you're tied in all of time. This picture is taken from from Jerusalem, as you look, that, that hill in the background there is the Mount of Olives. So, like I said, we call it a mount in southern Indiana. That's a hill. That's, that's the Mount of Olives. And while it has changed a bit, it really hasn't changed all that much. As a matter of fact, oh, they call, they, there's these big, gnarly, huge uh, uh, olive trees there. The, the locals call them Romani which means they came from the Roman times. There are olive trees there that witnessed this event that are still there to this day. And you see, as he would have come over the top, as a matter of fact, kind of that saddle to the left. Uh, to the right, there's a huge graveyard. To the left, that saddle right there is where they, they traditionally say, this is where Jesus came down on the donkey. And folks were so excited that they're putting out their their robes and the palm branches ahead of him. And they were singing, remember, those songs of Hillel. Crowds, make sure you, you, they didn't just break into song. This is what they were doing. These are the songs that they would have sang. Hosanna, save us, is what that means. Save us. And folks would, would, would be at the city gate. If you read Psalm 118, this is where this comes from. Uh, they'd say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is actually a coronation song. This is a song that originally was written for the coronation of a king. 
You see what the gospel writers are doing now. The king is returning, and they would say, from the house of God, we welcome you. And here's Jesus coming down on the donkey, and folks are getting excited about it. And boy, the Pharisees get all worked up about this. You know, they're, they're the religious muckety-mucks, and they're saying, Jesus, you have to slow down your disciples right now, but he's not having any of it. He says, look, if they stop, the rocks are going to start crying out. All of creation now is aware that the king has come. The king is here. Son of David. Remember the blind men just before this? Son of David, save us. Now the true greater son of David is riding into town. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Between the reports about Lazarus as a matter of fact, Lazarus is most assuredly here now. The healing of the blind, the, the, the donkey, Zechariah 9.9, 9, people are, there's no way to miss what's happening here. There's no way to miss the excitement of the fact that the promised descendant of David, the true king, the Messiah, the word made flesh, oh, he's coming. And he's riding into town right now. And at this point, make, make sure we get this. At this point, Jesus has not only revealed who he is, but he has forced their hands. We can't make a big enough difference or, or a big enough deal about this. If the crowds are recognizing that Jesus is king, who's not king? Caesar. That's a problem. For, for the Romans, this is a huge problem. So this literally means that they are going to have to give back Israel and say, hey, we're, we're, we're going to bow out now. Your true king is here. Or they have to kill him. There's really no room in between. But also for the Pharisees, for the religious muckety-mucks, if this is the king, then they have to bow and they have to give their allegiance to him. Or he has to be removed. The stage is set now. There's no way around this. Everyone is in a pickle. The, the, the plans that had been set before the foundations of the earth, before God ever said, let there be light, this moment was in his mind. And you see the culmination of all of history, all of history right here. New Testament scholar John Weatherly says the, 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 the Bible narratives, the, the gospels, all they really are are the passion narratives with real long introductions. In other words, everything that the gospel writers were trying to do was just an introduction to get you to this moment, to this time. But then it's over. We, we read it, and he goes to the, to the temple complex, and then he just walks out of town. And from there, everything goes from, from great to terrible. If you read the accounts after this, uh, in the amount that the gospel writers give us here, you think Mark, Mark is only 16 chapters. He takes 11 of the 30 some odd years of Jesus's life and the rest, the next five are all about here. All of the gospel writers focus in here because here it all turns from celebration to mourning. Over, over the next week, Jesus is going to start a riot in the temple. He does it the next morning. He kills a fig tree, which as we've seen, it's pretty hard to do. He argues with the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. They decide that he has to die now. He gets sold out by one of his friends, a disciple from the beginning. He gets sold out for the price of a common slave, 30 pieces of silver. 
in the middle of all that, in the middle of all this intensity, he hits the brakes and, and he tells, gets his disciples together and he says, make sure you see that the way to go forward is like this, and he washes their feet. Because the way of Jesus is the way of serving, because to serve is to have the right seat at the table, not to have a privileged seat at the table. Then he institutes the Lord's Supper. He heads out to the Mount of Olives. We've seen there's nothing in between the Mount of Olives and and, uh, Mount Moriah where, where Jerusalem is. There's just a big valley in between which means he had to watch Judas and the temple guard come all the way through. It was at night, torches. His best friends that he asked to to pray with him, they're sound asleep. And he watched. He asked, think about this, God the Son asks God the Father. He said, if there's another way through this, would, would you show it to me? The silence was deafening. He's at the point now in in, in this week where it says he's so stressed he's actually sweating blood. I've I've read some doctor's accounts of what had happened there. He said the likelihood that, that he could have physically died at this point was actually fairly great. But we know from a divine standpoint, he can't die there because he has to get to a cross. He prays, and then you see him change. He gets up with a whole different resolve, and he says, let's go. As he's watching Judas and the guards come, he'll be arrested. The next day, he'll stand three different trials. As a matter of fact, in, in, after one trial, they have, they have this... Uh, um, uh, thing that the, that the governor did there, once a year they would release a prisoner. So just to make the people happy. Now don't miss this prisoner's name. Matthew tells us his name is Jesus Barabbas. Jesus Barabbas. You know what Jesus means? That, that God saves. Barabbas, now how do Hebrew names work? Bar means the son of Bar Abba. Jesus, the son of the father, is this man's name. Don't miss it. That sort of name would have come from a Levitical family. He would have been part of the the, the program there, part of the privileged. It says that he was part of an uprising. He is everything they want. Jesus, the, the true son of the father, the word made flesh, stands there beaten. Jesus, the so-called son of the father, stands there as well. Pilate says, who do you want? Give us Barabbas. Give us what we want. These are the same crowds that welcomed him, welcomed him just a few days ago. And he was put to death like a common criminal. Make sure we get this. We, we, we put crosses everywhere to remind us. But in their day, crosses were everywhere. Uh, during an uprising just after this, Josephus, who was a, he was a historian, he tells us that they actually ran out of wood because they made so many crosses. And they take them outside of town and just hang. It was designed to shame. Slow, painful embarrassing and ugly. Just the week before, the beginning of the week, Palm Sunday we call it, he rides into town with people singing his praises from the house of the Lord, we welcome you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And now, it's over, and you go, I, I don't get this, and here's the deal. It's, you can't understand Palm Sunday without tying it to Easter, without seeing how this works. There's a New Testament scholar by the name of Michael Parsons in his excellent commentary on uh, uh, Luke. He writes this. 
Jesus sees his reign not as nationalistic, but as universal. His mission includes not only proclaiming release to the captives, but also recovery of sight to the blind, good news to the poor. His crown is not a crown of, or his crown is a crown of thorns. His throne, a splintery cross. His exaltation does not come in riding a horse-drawn chariot amid the, amid the cheers of family and friends. Rather, he finds his glory in being raised up on a cross amid the jeers of the masses. Through his death and resurrection, this one who refuses to be an earthly king makes his royal entry by way of a cross in an empty tomb. So you, you read about Palm Sunday, and you read the, the way that Jesus writes, and then you see how it, how it all goes downhill from there. And the, the question becomes, so what do you do with Palm Sunday? Who is Palm Sunday for? Palm Sunday is for those who are living in the already and the not yet. Those of us who have We've experienced salvation, but we know we've got a long way to go, and we look forward to that day, that day when those struggles are gone. Those who are, who are stuck in the middle of the Passion Week, Palm Sunday is for those who are poor in spirit. We want to follow Christ, but we recognize our own brokenness. I don't know about you, but how many times have, have, have I said, I've been a Christian for a long time. How come I'm still struggling with this? It seems like if Christ lifted his hand for a moment, I would run off as fast as I can. Palm Sunday is for those who mourn. And if you've ever really mourned, you'll know that there, there is a mourning that only God can heal. Palm Sunday is for the humble, for the meek. Palm Sunday is for those who, who hunger for righteousness. You turn on the news, you look around. For goodness sakes, we look in our own homes, and we go, this isn't the way this is supposed to be. Palm Sunday is for the peacemakers in a world that wants anything but. Palm Sunday is for those who are willing to face persecution for following Jesus. Palm Sunday is the promise that salvation is coming. Palm Sunday is important because there are times when we come to church and singing is natural. You know, you've just had one of those weeks and you've had one of those Palm Sunday kind of entrance and everything and you're just like, it's just about to flow out of me either way. But there are also those days when you have to sing to remind yourself. If that's you, Palm Sunday's for you. Let's pray. Lord, with the crowds, we shout Hosanna, and the hallelujahs come easily. But then we're reminded that life isn't always like that, and we get stuck in between Palm Sunday and Easter. Would you remind us that Easter's coming? Would you remind us again that you've conquered the grave? Would you remind us again that no matter how dark it gets, that you are the victor? Would you remind us again that no matter how difficult the struggle is, that you've already made it to the other side and that we will be with you? On those moments when we're stuck in between Palm Sunday and Easter. Pull us forward, Lord. Help us to take our eyes, not just to the fickle crowds, 
but to the reality of an empty tomb. Remind us again that you've said that you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. You're awesome. Amen.